The year was 1853, and tensions had reached a boiling point, threatening to ignite a conflict of catastrophic proportions. It was in this volatile cauldron of political intrigue, territorial ambitions, and clashing ideologies that the Crimean War was born a clash that would reshape the fate of nations and leave an indelible mark on the annals of history. Like most wars, the one that was involved in the Crimea was ill thought through and poorly planned, and the public outcry led to a radical improvement in the proper medical care for forces fighting overseas. The Crimean War was, in part, fueled by Russia's age-old animosity towards the Ottoman Turks. This simmering rivalry, spanning centuries, had its roots in Russia's insatiable thirst for warm water ports and the safeguarding of its Orthodox Christian subjects dwelling within Turkey. Yet, these tensions were not confined to the solitary realm of Russia and the Ottomans. Other European powers, notably Britain, had their own vested interests, desiring to maintain the Ottomans as a shield against Russian belligerents while simultaneously exploiting them as a lucrative market for their trade. For centuries, France had held an exclusive mandate, safeguarding and overseeing the Roman Catholics within the Ottoman Empire since the year 1740. However, as the 19th century unfolded, the influence of France in the Near East began to wane, making way for Russia to steadily ascend in its place. By 1850, the French Emperor Napoleon III, yearning to regain France's lost dominance over the Christian communities of Turkey, embarked on a mission to reclaim his nation's authority. Citing past treaties as evidence, both Russia and the Turks declared that Russia, not France, was the true protector of Orthodox Christians. Abandoning their former allegiance to France, the Ottomans opted to join forces with Russia, altering the fragile balance of power. In response, Napoleon III resorted to a strategy of gunboat diplomacy, deploying the mighty French ship of the line, Charlemagne, as a formidable display of force. The Turks were compelled to yield, succumbing to France's demands, and signing a fresh new treaty that reaffirmed the Catholic position of power. In the July of 1853, the Russian Tsar, Nicholas I, decided to test the very limits of Turkey's strength and authority. With audacious intent, Russian troops occupied the two Ottoman Danubian principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia. The British ambassador to the Ottomans, Stratford Canning, offered a glimmer of support. With the weight of British backing behind them, the Ottoman Turks made a bold move. On October 16, 1853, they declared war on Russia, with the Battle of Oltenita on November 4 becoming the first engagement of the war and the first Ottoman victory. In late November, the Russian Black Sea Fleet chanced upon the Ottoman fleet in the harbor of Sinop. What followed would forever be etched in history as the infamous Massacre at Sinop. The foreign press, including esteemed publications like The Times, seized this golden opportunity to dub it as such and twist public opinion into an anti-Russian and jingoistic one.
the fiery storm of public opinion in France and Britain swirled around the looming specter of war. The Russian rejection of a revised peaceful resolution served as the perfect catalyst, granting the two nations the proper justification they sought to align themselves with the Turks in March. Under the command of Lord Raglan and Marshal St. Arnaud, the British and French forces embarked on a journey to Varna to thwart the Russian occupation of Wallachia and Moldavia. The Allies, the British especially, suffered from a drought of capable officers, their ranks filled with the inexperienced and the inept. As if that weren't enough, the armies were plagued by merciless outbreaks of cholera and dysentery. Finally, the Russians complied to Allied demands to evacuate the Danubian principalities, leaving 60,000 troops dying and with no clear goal. September arrived, and the Allied armies were decided to be transported across the waters to the Crimean town of Eupatoria, a mere 35 miles north of Sevastopol, the main base for the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Complications in logistics forced the armies to abandon much of their supplies, the soldiers without water and inadequate clothing during their march south. At this point, the generals showed themselves to be a match for the politicians in incompetence. On September 20th, the 60,000 Allied troops came across Russian troops positioned on a series of ridges overlooking the river Alma, forming a strong defensive line. The Allies commenced their attack by crossing the river. French forces managed to scale the heights on the Russian right flank, while the British, supported by naval gunfire, launched their own assault. By the end of the day, the Allies emerged victorious at the Battle of the Alma. The Russian forces retreated in disarray, allowing the Allies to advance on Sevastopol unopposed.
arse. It does say in the Times newspaper that Sebastopol has fallen. I am fallen. And I'm fallen alongside you. Uh, I'm not responsible for every damn lie that newspaper prints. You mustn't believe all you read in the Times, Captain Jubilee. Sebastopol has not fallen. I'm not aware how the Times came by such information. I'm not allowed my tent in the lines. Indeed, Sevastopol had not fallen. Instead, the French and British, now joined by a small Turkish contingent, surrounded the city and began to construct trench works throughout the Heracles Peninsula in October. To sustain this siege, the British established vital supply points at Balaclava, while the French secured theirs at Kamiesh. In a bid to avoid being trapped, the Russian general Prince Menshikov made the difficult decision to evacuate the city, leaving behind a formidable garrison of 35,000 men. Admiral Kornilov and Lieutenant Colonel Todleben were entrusted with the command, while Prince Menshikov took additional measures to safeguard their position. He scuttled a significant portion of the Russian fleet in Sevastopol, sealing off any potential access to the city's natural harbor by the Allied forces. On October 17th, 126 Allied guns began a bombardment of the Russian defenses for a number of hours. A lucky Russian shell struck the French magazine at Mount Rudolph, silencing their guns. Similarly, the British guns had their own moment of triumph, their bombardment claiming the life of Admiral Kornilov. Yet the dawn of the next day revealed an astonishing sight. The resilient Russians had meticulously reconstructed their shattered parapets, a pattern that would continue throughout the siege. Outside of the trench works of Sevastopol, two key battles occurred. On October 25th, the Battle of Balaclava took place. The Russian army, under the command of General Leprandi, attacked the British and French positions at Balaclava in an attempt to disrupt their supply lines. Russian cavalry charges were repulsed by the unwavering bravery of the 93rd Highland Brigade, turning back the Russians in what became known as the Thin Red Line. The infamous Charge of the Light Brigade occurred soon after. The British cavalry charged the Russian artillery but were met with heavy resistance and suffered heavy losses. Despite being portrayed as a failure with a deadly price tag behind it, the charge was effective in achieving the goals of any ordinary cavalry charge, it scattered the Russians and broke their morale. On the morning of November 5, 1854, in dense fog and bitter cold, the Russian forces launched a surprise assault on the weakly guarded British and French positions in the Inkerman Valley. However, their efforts were thwarted by the timely arrival of French reinforcements. Captain Henry Hugh Clifford went on to describe the carnage after the Battle of Inkerman. I rode over the field of battle after it was over, and the sight was truly heartrending. The Russians lay in such heaps it was quite impossible to form any idea of their numbers. It is said they lost 10,000, but I will not answer for the truth of this report. All I can say is that they were driven back with very much greater loss them than ourselves, and never for a moment got possession of any part of our positions. I thought the wounds I saw at Alma were so dreadful, I could never see worse. But some of the bayonet wounds and round shot yesterday were far worse. The weather changed from mild autumn to winter in November 1854. A great winter storm struck on November 14th, destroying much of the shipping to the British and French bases, which contained the supplies needed to survive the winter and conduct the siege. The Allied troops were unprepared. Inadequate winter clothing exposed the soldiers to the bone-chilling cold. Supply lines and logistics were stretched thin, resulting in severe food shortages for the troops. Lieutenant Richard Llewellyn went on to write, 28 men of our regiment have died of cholera during the last 48 hours. The strongest men, those who have never been ill before, die soonest, never seeming to make a struggle. It is an awful disease to witness. Last night I was talking to Elijah Prime, pioneer of my company, the cheeriest, strongest fellow in camp. He was as full of life and as ready to help anyone as usual. The morning what cholera had left of him was carried past me, the face so distorted that I could not recognize a feature. Sergeant Frederick Newman of the 97th Regiment also wrote in a letter of his. 
We are now about three miles from Sebastopol and under canvas tents, the rain pouring in torrents and all around miserable. Cholera has broke out amongst the poor fellows who are exposed in the trenches day and night with nothing but their big coats to shelter them from the rain or cold. We get biscuits, salted pork or beef, and one gill of rum with some sugar rice and unroasted coffee. We manage it somehow by grinding it in a broken bombshell with a round shot to crush it. Water is very scarce and extremely muddy. I have not washed my face nor yet shaved since I landed here, being satisfied with enough to drink without washing my face. And as for a clean shirt, I think when I can find it convenient to wash one, then I will put one on. This terrible cholera has made fearful ravages here. I have just commenced to write again, and there are now six poor fellows lying dead. I am rather loose in my bowels, but take as much care of myself as possible. He would die of fever two weeks later. The conditions of freezing trenches, a collapsed supply route, lack of rations and improper winter clothing and shelter reduced Britain's fighting force at Sevastopol to just 12,000. Such issues were regular during Britain's overseas conflicts. However, the war in the Crimea was the first to be really reported on by the press. With the help of the Times War correspondent William Howard Russell, the shortcomings of the army were openly broadcasted. One such shortcoming was the medical care at the main hospital at Scutari in Constantinople. The ill-equipped and understaffed situation at Scutari was described by acting assistant surgeon Henry Bellew. They were with few exceptions in a truly pitiable state of filth and utterly helpless from wounds and debility. On being brought inside the hospital, several were found to be dead. Many were at their last gasp and others, it was evident, had but a short time to live. Almost all the living were swarming with vermin, huge lice crawling all about their persons and clothes. Many were grimed with mud, dirt, blood, etc., and gunpowder stains. Several were more or less severely wounded, and others were completely prostrated by fever and dysentery. The abhorrent conditions at Scutari led to the British government to form a sanitary commission to investigate the issue. The progressive sanitary doctrines practiced by Florence Nightingale, one of the hospital managers, and her staff of nurses helped reduce the death rate at Scutari by half in the spring. Their measures to overhaul sanitary conditions in the field hospitals and camps proved to be successful, setting a new standard. The arrival of spring allowed the British and French Army's conditions to significantly improve. The troops were now given proper clothing and food. The horse's health was restored, and a railway was built to transport supplies. During this time, a contingent of 15,000 troops led by General La Marmora from the Kingdom of Sardinia arrived. La Marmora helped turn back a Russian offensive that aimed to break the siege at the Battle of the Chernaya in August. By September, the French had noticed that the Russians switched garrisons every day at midday, leaving the defensive works temporarily empty. A new assault on the Malakov Redoubt was planned for that time, taking advantage of this vulnerability. The surprise attack by the French on the 8th worked in their favor as they stormed the Russian positions. After fierce fighting, they successfully captured the Malakov. The Russians surrendered soon after. The Russians burned the remaining ships of the Black Sea Fleet on September 11, 1855, effectively ending the siege. It is estimated that 100,000 Russians were killed in the defense of Sevastopol. The war itself did not last much longer. The Crimean War was not only confined to the Crimea, but other parts of Russia as well. The Baltic theater is one such front that has been rather neglected. The Russian capital city of St. Petersburg was located on the coast of the Baltic Sea, and a quick allied landing and capture of the city could hasten peace negotiations and shorten the war. Here, the allied navies of France and Britain bombarded fortresses and ports along the Aland and Finnish coasts throughout 1854 and 55, at one point using the largest fleet assembled since the Napoleonic Wars, but resulted in very little long-term strategic or tactical victory. As the war progressed, 
the Ottoman Empire and its allies sought to halt the Russian Empire's advances in the Caucasus region. The major action of the theater was the siege of Kars, lasting from June to November 1855. The Ottoman garrison, fortified within the city walls of Kars, withstood the Russian onslaught. After months of relentless bombardment, dwindling supplies upon the arrival of winter, the Ottoman defenders surrendered Kars to the Russian Empire. In 1856, the Crimean War ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. The negotiations leading to the Treaty of Paris took place in Paris from February to March 1856. Representatives from Russia, the Ottoman Empire, France, Britain, and the Kingdom of Sardinia convened to seek a resolution to the conflict and establish terms for peace. The Treaty of Paris recognized the neutrality and independence of the Black Sea as well as the Åland Islands in the Baltic Sea, prohibiting any naval presence or fortifications. Along with this, the Russian Empire was required to surrender territories it had seized during the war, including the mouth of the Danube River and parts of Bessarabia. To a similar effect, the principle of free navigation in the Black Sea and the Danube River was established, ensuring open access for all countries. Moldavia and Wallachia, under Ottoman suzerainty, were granted an increased level of autonomy, leading to their eventual union as Romania in 1859. The treaty reaffirmed the Ottoman Empire's sovereignty and territorial integrity as well. The Sardinian politician, Count Camillo di Cavour, used Sardinia's role in the Crimean War at the negotiations as a stepping stone to further talks and gain support for the idea of Risorgimento, Italian unification. Cavour was successful in gaining the support of the French, who went on to aid Sardinia during the Second Italian War of Independence in 1859. With the outbreak of the Crimean War, diplomatic blunders on Russia's side alienated any potential allies, particularly one in Britain. The Russian government misread Britain's position, assuming their support, as well as inexplicably fueling British fears of Russian expansion into India. Throughout the war, Russia's logistical disadvantages, such as poor transportation and communication systems, outdated weapons, or a lack of weapons in general, and issues with supply lines, contributed to their defeat. The defeat prompted a national re-evaluation and a push for reform in Russia, led by Tsar Alexander II. This included reforms in bureaucracy and the emancipation of serfdom in the empire, an institution that had long contributed to Russia's backwardness. Perhaps the most negatively affected power by the conclusion of the Crimean War was the Austrian Empire, despite it not being an official participant. Austria had maintained a close alliance with Russia prior to the Crimean War since 1815. Russia would go so far as to help put down the Hungarian Revolution of 1848. However, the war placed Austria in a difficult position as it attempted to balance its support for Russia while also avoiding direct involvement in the conflict. The Habsburgs decided to better focus on its influence in Germany and Italy. Alongside this, the war had significant financial costs for Austria. While it managed to avoid direct involvement in the conflict, it had to maintain a large military force to protect its eastern borders in Galicia and be prepared for any potential developments. The financial strain of maintaining this military readiness, coupled with the economic disruption caused by the war, put a burden on the Austrian economy. Ultimately, Austria's newfound isolation allowed Prussia to encroach on their influence in Germany unimpeded, leading to the eventual outbreak of the Austro-Prussian War in 1866 and the conclusion of the Italian Risorgimento by 1870, the Habsburgs neutered of any potential opportunity of militaristic or diplomatic expansion in either region. Over 600,000 soldiers died in the war with around 250,000 deaths. 
Many of these deaths were caused not by direct combat, but by disease, starvation, and poor medical care. The British Army in particular suffered near utter destruction solely by disease alone. The poor management of the war effort, from inadequate supplies and logistics to ineffective leadership and communication, played a major role in the high casualty rate. Especially bloody engagements, particularly the charge of the Light Brigade during the Battle of Balaclava, has been used as the poster boy of incompetence, poor and rash decision-making, abhorrent logistic systems, and neglect of soldiers' welfare. The public outcry, specifically in Britain, over the mistreatment of troops in the Crimea led to a seemingly all-encompassing rage and animosity towards the British government. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, George Hamilton Gordon, the Earl of Aberdeen, who was responsible for Britain's entry into the war, would also be responsible for his government's fall as a result of the outcry and incompetence in 1855. The lessons learned from this tragic episode eventually propelled significant reforms, reshaping military practices, health care, and international relations, ultimately leading to a more critical understanding of the importance of effective leadership, logistics, and diplomacy in times of war.